friends, colleagues, travelers together, welcome to this CWME Day 21, the first session of day one, as we gather around the theme, Rise to Life, Doing Theology in Public Spaces. I am Michael Jagasar, and I'm one of CWM's mission secretary. I'm an Indo-Caribbean wanderer, currently located in Britain. And I'm here at the CWM, the Council for Our Mission London office. We are delighted that you can join us across multiple time zones. I would like to take this opportunity inviting our general secretary, the Reverend Dr. Yusuf Kum, to offer a short message on behalf of the Council for World Mission. Dr. Kum. Dear sisters and brothers, warm greetings to you in the, in the name of our Lord mm -hmm. Jesus, the Liberator. On behalf of the Council for World Mission family, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all to this EDARE 2021 online event. There, discernment and radical engagement is the one of the most significant programs of the Council for World Mission. Despite the fact that we are not gathering offline, I believe this program still offers all of us a creative space as we come together to discuss our challenges, share our wisdom, and discern together what is God's mission today in the pandemic-stricken world. Systemic greed, sharp economic disparities, environmental destruction, world economies, supremacist ideologies, and exploitation of vulnerable people are some of many that stand out to mirror the extent of its moral decadence today. It seems the survival of the fittest is the only rule which is functional at the moment in the context of COVID-19. However, friends, we do not believe that the power of God love is inferior to the powers of death. We affirm that power of resurrection subjugates the all powers of death. How then can we witness God love in a way that our witness nurtures, protects, and enhances life? What alternative visions and signposts do we have to offer to a world that finds itself at crossroad, how can we reimagine the mission and theology, which is transformative in a pandemic-stricken world? Therefore, we can no longer be mere spectators of these injustice, violence, and destructions. We need to discern and radically engage with this world. We need to rise to dismantle the systems of operations and systems that deny life. We need to rise to life, chanting down Babylon. It is on this line, this year's e -day is planned under the theme of rise to life, doing theology in public places, to discern the call and mission of God and creatively but radically engage with this world. Therefore, I would like to thank you all sparing your time and participating in this EDEA program. Let us use this time and space as a platform for not only sharing our stories of resistance and resilience, but also reimagine, rethink, and rearticulate our theology in public sphere. As I close my greetings, I would like to thank all the panelists and my colleagues who work hard organizing this significant event. Reverend Dr. Michael Jagasa, Dr. Sioni Harea, 
Mrs. Uh, Sai Kata, uh, Ms. Uh, Peach uh, Lavayo, and all those directly and indirectly adding their support to this program. Wish you all these three days of challenging, inspiring, as well as thought-provoking sessions. May the triangle God, God creator, God the liberator, God the comfort be with you all and bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Yusuf Kyu. Friends and colleagues, as we move into our presentations, I'd like to indicate some notes that some of it you'll be aware of. Please note that this webinar is being recorded with the intention to edit and make it available at a later date. <clears throat> We're going to pose a couple of poll questions so that you can work your fingers and brain nicely on your screen. Please take at most 30 seconds to answer these and your kind attention would be greatly appreciated. Please use the Zoom question and answer um, feature if you need to make a comment or if you want to ask a question. You can also, if you're joining us through Facebook, use the Facebook comments section to submit your questions and to make comments for the panelists. We would really want to receive this and appreciate such a gesture. It is now my task to introduce the panelists. Um, we would not be introducing the panelists by giving you a reading of their full biographies because they're all very distinguished colleagues. You'll find their fuller biographies of the members of this panel at the Dear Web page, which will be placed in the Zoom chat and the Facebook comment section and a link where you can read about our colleagues. Can we look there to learn more about the members of the panel, their location, their work, and their commitments. The panelists will be spotlighted as names are mentioned. We will be beginning or starting with the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson reading her poem titled Testify, following by four presentations from Miguel de la Torre, Professor de la Torre, Dr. Gregory Cuellar, and Dr. Tearua Runtree. We would also be joined by uh, an artist activist, Maxime de Palm, who would be reflecting back to us into, around her own art. And after the presentations, Victoria Turner will offer a short response to the poem and presentations aimed at getting us started in our discussion. Victoria is a listener and a very important person in this process. The voices in this opening session of EDARE 21 both call for and witness to the possibility of rising to life, rising from the Caribbean, Oceania, Africa, Europe, the Americas. And these presenters, colleagues, will both invite us to rise to life as well as to show us how we might enable rising to life in public places in public spaces. So i like to now invite Karen Georgia to read her poem. Listen to testify. We struggle with what we see, witnesses to the resident brokenness of life, our hearts ill at ease as we question who we are in the presence of this sea of misery and suffering. Faces radiating hunger and poverty confront us on busy streets. Hearts consumed by loneliness stand next to us, beating the rhythm of life, transcending time. We struggle to comprehend the wicked, consumed and driven by their greed, the raging pursuits of the 1%, outpacing the rights of those in need. With eyes open, we witness changes to earth and sky. The waters of the earth are rising around us, calling out the chaos of our times. We are silent onlookers, surveying the carnage of centuries. Eyewitnesses to the bruising of hope, our lips mouthing words inadequate 
to describe the breaches we see. Troubled waters surround us, pools created from our tears, their depths teeming with fear, holding the wreckage of broken lives and hearts, scarred by trauma and marred by distress. What say we to the millions who died? Their memories archived as statistics, victims of pandemics, their voices rising in unison, crying in protest to the lies they hear in our silence. We are not well. The festering of dis-ease a sign, our restlessness a condition, calling forth new language for creating a new world, one where all will live well and flourish. We listen for God talk to inspire, words of power to call into being a new creation, the eighth day where righteousness prevails when justice will flow as sweet, rushing waters to cleanse and to heal all brokenness. Instead, death visits daily, multinationals stealing water and deforesting lands, food deserts overtaking the health of the poor, their blinding sands filling the mouth and bellies of parents crying for justice while begging food for their children. Necropolitics dictating the fate of them labeled as marginalized dispensing life to the rich, crushing underfoot lives resistant to control, attempting to maintain semblances of an exclusive normal. We testify to vindicate the innocent, lives before their potential materialized. To the shameful greed producing suffering, to the scandal of excess, to the hoarding of wealth and resources, to the near extinction of hope and possibility. Our words are not enough. An inadequate offering preferred to those robbed of their dignity, deprived of respect, rendered unable to flourish. We offer God talk in a language obsolete to the masses, words no longer understood by those in need of hope. In this pandemic-laden world where disease flourishes, snatching lives from the innocent, uncovering the lies we told ourselves, we witness death as we hold our words. The waters are rising among us waters teeming with hatred and fear, waters overwhelming as they carry silt and sediment of histories long forgotten, stories presumed buried, their characters preying on the innocent. We watch. We dream we are awake, an awakening contrived from visions of ourselves as makers of change, illusions of our salvation and safety, shrouding the reality of our times. We are called to God action, gushing like, well, like new wells in dry places, the living waters of justice, hope, and courage flowing freely all around us. These living waters bring new life and new hope new possibilities. Quenching parched souls needing healing from their fragility. The repaired turned repairers of the breach. We testify to the dawning of a new world. Ashe, Ashe, Asheo. Thank you very much, Karen Georgia Thompson for that call to arise. We will now listen to our other panelists and we'll go in this particular order. We'll hear firstly from Miguel, then Gregory, then Teroa, and Maxine. And panelists would speak to, for eight to ten minutes and um, um, Miguel, you're first on. Gracias. 
just besides the rivers of Miami, we sat and wept when we remembered La Habana. There on the palm trees, we hung our conga drums and maracas. Our oppressors asked us for song. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. Sing, they said. Sing us one of the songs of Cuba. <clears throat> Sing us some mambo. How can we sing our rumba in a, pog in a pagan land? If I forget you, mi Havana, may my right hand wither. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider La Habana my greatest joy. Remember, Lord, what the gringos did. O oh, daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dash them against the rocks. Both the poet of the 137th Psalm in the Hebrew Bible and my interpretation of the Psalm suffer from a post-traumatic stress caused by being ripped from our homes. Although some 2,600 years separate us, we share a similar experience and can thus relate to each other's pain of being cast out of the land which written, witnessed our birth. Forever foreigners, sojourners who will never belong aqui, here, or aya, there, how can the psalmist or me ever find fulfillment aqui, here, when aya, there, continues to beckon our return? How can either of us ever die in peace when our hearts were left behind buried in the land of our parents. Since going into exile, I left behind the bright blue skies of my island, which never again will hang above my head, or her warm ocean waters, which provided its warmth, loving embrace. How can either the psalmist or I forge an identity in exile? What if my love for La Habana remains stronger than my allegiance to the Babylon in which I find myself? How can I ever call myself a Cuban without a Cuba. Never again will I be able to lay on her hot tropical beaches, my bone destined to be in turn in the cold foreign land which never accepted me, despise my very presence. Perhaps there can never be a return to one's native land, only fractured memories upon which it is recreated, a new way of remembering which conveniently forgets reality. Those of us who have been undocumented in Babylon read in the story a God actively present in the hopelessness of being uprooted. To be an alien is so important that God incarnated God's self as an alien fleeing the oppressive consequences of the emperor of the empire of the time. The petty dictator Herod was tasked with ensuring profit in the form of taxes flow to the Roman center. Like many global South elites today, Herod financially benefited by signing trade treaty agreements detrimental to his compatriots. To ask why Jesus, a colonized person, found refuge in Egypt is to understand why Latinx are today in the United States. Jesus is not the only migrant found in Holy Writ. The biblical story is the story of aliens, foreigners, and sojourners. The first political refugees was Adam and Eve, forced to leave the land from which they were formed. Only those who have been torn from their homeland understand the gut-wrenching pain of being ousted from all one knows. It matters not who is at the fault for expatriation, and the resulting despair, distress, dispossession, and disenfranchisement which follows. The tales of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph are stories of aliens attempting to survive on the margins of a people who are not their own, which they cannot, and a land which they cannot claim. If they were living today, we would probably pejoratively call them illegals. The people who are who came to be called Jews or were people formed while suffering under slavery in the foreign land of Egypt. They became a nation while traversing the desert, having no land to claim as their own. They experienced exile in the far off places called Babylon, as well as disenfranchisement on their own terrain due to the colonial military occupation by the foreign empire, Rome. Many of us today, 
are refugees, like the Jews taken into captivity to Babylon in 587 before the Common Era, are forced to deal with the incomprehensible pain of being torn from one's own Eden. While sitting by the rivers of Babylon, the Jews, from the midst of their pain, questioned the sovereignty of a God who would tear God's people from their homes and plant them in an alien land which despises them. A major concern for those in exile, from Adam and Eve to the patriarch to the Jews in Babylon to Jesus and to me, is what does our status, what is, does our status as deportees mean? Does our removal from our homeland by which our very identity is constructed, signifies a divine rejection, voiding any future participation in God's plan? Does resettlement in a foreign land mean assimilation to a culture perceived to be inferior to our own? The Hebrew word for forced removal, gahot, means more than simply the results of international forces. For those cast into the diaspora, Galat becomes a religious condition, a condition which forces the displaced person to ask the basic theodicy questions. How can a loving and powerful God allow such unbearable pain to befall God's people? The hopelessness of never returning to what one has left behind makes the deeply political 137 Psalm also a deeply religious proclamation. For all the biblical wanderers and me sitting by the rivers of Miami, faith is a means of coping with the existential situation of dislodgement, hopelessly trying to give meaning to the shame and humiliation of displacement, of still remembering as a small white, as a small boy, white teenagers spit on my father while calling him a spick. For here is the irony. While North Americans claim to love Jesus and welcome him into their hearts, they hate Jesus and cast him into cages located in our southern borders. To this day, refugees like me carry the emotional, spiritual, and physical stigmata caused by growing up as a spick in a culture and society who loathe my presence, constantly defining me to this day as less than. I am left, want to, I am left to wonder that had Zeus, like me, cried himself to sleep, was he even beaten up for speaking with a funny accent? Did he ever internalize feelings of inferiority imposed by a dominant culture? If so, then Jesus knows the anxieties and frustrations of the undocumented. And with me, as Sue's wept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel, for your reflection on sitting and weeping by the rivers of Babylon. We'll come back in our discussion time for further engagement and conversation. Gregory would be speaking on lamentations as a healing response to necropolitical power at a Texas-Mexico border. Gregory? Thank you to the EDARE organizers for the invitation. To encounter the agony of colonized people through the representations of another, a range of ethical dilemmas are bound to emerge from voyeurism to consumerism, to narcissism, to outright denial of the veracity of such re realities. But are our ethics of representation only to be determined by this cynical array of human responses? To pose the question Susie Linfield asks about photographs of suffering people, quote, since such images are cesspools of manipulation and exploitation, why look? Indeed, if witnessing from afar the traumatization of the other, does little to change what Edward Said calls, quote, the grotesqueries and pathologies of power. Why then read texts, hear lyrical music, or see images that depict their suffering? Without question, global, global media outlets in general 
and the entertainment industry in particular has inundated our line of sight with around the clock images of people fleeing from wars, famine, natural disasters, or mass shootings, and black and brown people dying from unjust police violence. To render these revolving images of wounded people consumable, producers must resort to a re-victimizing dynamic in which the sufferer is confined to a single mold of, his, of expression, terror. As Sayak Valencia describes in her book, Gore Capitalism, quote, this denial of discourse and agency has a derealizing effect on these subjects, depicting them as silent, inarticulate, and ineffectual. And yet, does this information overload mean that the only ethical way to understand the lives of terrorized people is to censor them? I am not at all convinced that silencing them is a viable ethical mode of representation, let alone feasible in the current digital age. Here I am reminded of Linfield's sobering assessment of postmodern social critics when she declares, quote, it has become all too easy to avert one's eyes. Indeed, to do so is considered a virtue. But as the video of George Floyd struggling to breathe while handcuffed and pinned to the ground by a Minneapolis police officer has shown us, how can we not look at the unjust suffering of people? Was it not impossible to see his deadly plight without seeing the unjust violence that was causing it? How is the inhumane carnage ever redressed in our world if expert interpreters of social reality, both past and present, avert their eyes from the people in power, those sanctioning the violence? For just as representing suffering people is ethically fraught, Remaining in a postmodern ethic of not looking is equally prone to expert malpractice. Although not modern photographs, the poetic images of postcolonial trauma in the Book of Lamentations invites us, indeed summons us, to pay attention, to reflect, to learn, to examine how imperial violence operates in the mass production of human suffering. Here, lamenting in the aftermath of human inhuman carnage also serves as a way to critically uh, knowing about the pathologies of empire. Through lament, the colonized poet of lamentations registered the melancholic depths of the imperial wound, while at the same time mapping an imperial praxis of violence as a, uh, as a form of social critique. Here, the colonized poet risked investing in an ethic of knowing how empire and agents operate rather than succumbing to a posture of not knowing. In this way, the poetry of lamentations attests to a resilient mode of lamenting in which the gore of colonization deserves full expression without acquiescing to the debilitating effects of post-colonial melancholia. In providing us with the gory details of imperial conquest, the colonized poet is not glorifying violence as is typical in the current entertainment industry, but rather provides a trustworthy guide or a blueprint of what exactly agents of empire are capable of doing to those they have deemed the other. This approach to lament takes seriously a resonating proposition that Ashish Nandi, a founding figure of post-colonial studies, made in response to the tragic aftermath of Western colonialism in Asia, quote, that we have forgotten the language of mourning. For the Book of Lamentations, its language of mourning does not merely recognize what the Judeans had tragically lost after 587 BCE, it reveals in its own way how they lost their city, people, and livelihoods to a violently expanding empire. 
Hence, this paper aims to distill the poetics of mourning in the Book of Lamentations into a ethical discourse for engaging contemporary people victimized by colonizing and tyrannical forms of elite power. Such a discourse would also include an ethic of representation, that is, a way to show others the suffering we have been summoned to see. The particular context I aim to apply this ethical discourse of mourning uh, to is the Texas-Mexico borderlands and to the perennial suffering that migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees endure at the, age, at the hands of agents of the nation state. Although we are flooded with images of their precarity on cable news and social media, this way of seeing has yielded more a language of statistics for data's sake, rather than a language of mourning for actual people. As an expert interpreter of biblical texts, who is from the Texas-Mexico borderlands, colonizing power not only gave rise to the, to the construction of the U.S. southern border, but it also has morphed into what Achille Mbembe calls necro power, a term that aims, quote, to account for the various ways in which our contemporary world weapons are deployed in the interest of maximally destroying persons and creating death worlds. At the Texas-Mexico border, black and brown-bodied migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees have come to define its death worlds. Classified by those in power as the people who do not matter and are hence disposable, U.S. border security operations and anti-black and brown immigration policies have been weaponized to drive migrants to their deaths, whether by drowning in the Rio Grande, by dehydration in the desert, by cartel kidnappers, or by suicide in immigration detention, to name a few. Rather than adopt the Western postmodern virtue of not looking, how might we ethically engage their violent disposal? What sorts of genres, images, narratives, lyrical poetry, or cultural productions should we consider to represent their traumatizing push to the end of life by agents of the nation state? How do their own representations of their victimization both beckon us to uh, pay attention and indict us as accomplices to the very nefarious power structures that, that have shortened their lifespans? In an attempt to respond to these probing ethical questions, this paper turns to the poetics of mourning in the Book of Lamentations in effort to learn a language of mourning that does not simply troubles our souls with their tragic deaths, but also quickens our awareness of the pathologies of necro power at the Texas-Mexico border. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregory. There are indeed connections from Karen Georgia to Miguel and to you, Gregory, and as I think of the poetics that you're pleading for here. We are going to turn to our next speaker who, whose presentation is a recorded one, even though she's present. So the Aroa Rontri's presentation would be projected for us because of internet connection, but she'll be here to participate in the conversation. No mai whakatau mai rā ki tēnei kōrero o te wā. Ko te aroha rāntri tōku i mua, he uri a hau nō ngai tū te auru, nō te iwi o ngā bohi. Nō reira e ngā iwi taketake, e ngā mana whenua, e ngā waka wairua o te ao whānui, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Let me share my screen. Greetings to you all who have joined this webinar. My name is Te Aroha Rountree. I am a lay preacher for Te Hahiwe Diriana o Aotearoa, the Methodist Church of New Zealand. And I am currently a senior lecturer in Māori and Moana studies at Trinity Methodist Theological College in Auckland, New Zealand. Te tiru whakamaua kia tīna, tīna haumie, huie, Defiance, determination, and decolonization. 
The Fakatoki or proverbial saying recited in the title of this paper calls our people together to unite for a common cause. The saying is common in haka or ceremonial dance and is a proclamation of the alliance of the people gathered and united, ready to progress their common purpose. The popular phrase is as much a rallying cry to battle as it is a call to action today. The saying is associated with the defiant nature of haka, the domain of tāne rore, or the ancestor of dance. The tradition of haka is reflected in the oral narratives, including that of Tiniro and Kai, most specifically the haka of Hine Te Iwa Iwa. Haka has been globalised by Te Rau Paraha of Ngāti Tūwharitoa Rangatira and his haka, Kamate Kamate Ka Ora Ka Ora. Haka are synonymous with strategies of intimidation, persuasion, and challenge. However, haka in large part are enacted to signal an issue or conflict and to seek restoration of an imbalance created by that conflict. The entertainment value placed upon haka is something that was made popular by sports teams and more recently with kapahaka or performance art and dance festivals and competitions. This paper is itself a declaration of defiance, determination and decolonization. It is a pertinent challenge to the imperialism and colonialism that exists within our Aotearoa context and continually imposes itself on our faith and theology as tangata whenua or people of this land. We as tangata whenua engage in defiance as native peoples, we battle, we resist, we deconstruct, we restory, and we untell lies and untruths that they tell about us, about empire and invasions, and intrusions into our lives and into our faith. Early Pākehā missionary accounts of Māori were often demeaning and derogatory, serving to portray a savage people in desperate need of both civilising and Christianising. Reverend Richard Taylor's early judgment of the pa or village and his misinterpretation of the tangihanga or funerary rituals was made evident in his comments. Wretchedness in every form, women all but naked with their heads and bodies smeared with ochre and oil, shrieking or crying and dirty children running about in a state of nudity all combined to form as wretched a whole as can well be imagined. We are now left to deconstruct and untell such lies and untruths, to challenge and change the Eurocentric lens of Pākehā missionaries that often determine the narrative of our history and culture. As native peoples, we were colonised by the British and we are constantly and inevitably engaged in defiance. We often express our defiance through oral tradition, performance art and dance, music, activism, radical resistance and truth telling. The whitewashed and whitewashing history of colonization and the romanticizing of missionary impact in our context serves to assimilate our native peoples into dominant Western Pākehā society. In 1917, Princess Te Puya Hirangi, the granddaughter of the Māori King Tafiao, was defiant in the face of government policy. Under mounting pressure from other Māori tribal and political leaders to engage her Waikato people in conscription, she was defiant. Te Puya opposed conscription and condemned the propaganda that war, war service was a matter of national pride. She argued that the 1860s government confiscations of Waikato lands needed to be addressed before she would consider sending her people to war. The government attempted to further pressure and alienate Te Puya's people by ordering Māori conscription from Waikato and Maniapoto tribes only. This did not deter the resolve of both Te Puya and her people, and when young men were arrested and imprisoned, she provided for them and their families, giving them hope and eventually advocating for their freedom. 
We exercise our capacity to resist, to push back against the expectations, to conform and to compromise. Our theologies are no different. They are mechanisms for freedom and cultural expressions of faith that demand change in church and society. The deconstructing of imposed theologies from our colonial history and experience seek to give voice and volume to our native theologies derived from our native language and wisdoms. The restoring requires a defiant re revisiting of our missionary and Māori encounters that have often sought to minimise the impacts of imperialism and Eurocentrism. The truth-telling requires an honest kōrero-rero or dialogue about systemic racism that continues to manifest itself within structures of church governance and in the policies and practices of church systems. We as tangata whenua demand self-determination. As native peoples, we fight for what all peoples desire, the right to determine our own ways of knowing and being in the world. There exists persistent and pervasive systemic and institutional racism founded on colonial preconceptions of white supremacy. These systems are perpetuated by those within the church institutions who benefit from white dominance and power. Church governance most often provides for policies and processes that continue to privilege Pākehā and give preference to Pākehā ideology and theology. The doctrine of discovery has been recognized as perhaps the most detrimental ideology used to justify the subjugation of indigenous peoples and the alienation of our lands. We as Tangata Whenua seek the road to decolonization. As native peoples, we evoke storytelling and truth telling for justice, for whenua, for moana, for iwi and all creation. Reverend Māori Marsden, in his writings, described colonisation of Māori as a highly predictable form that followed a successful pattern of domination and socio-political control, including pacification, appropriation of lands and resources, cultural genocide and assimilation. Decolonisation may require the reverse approach, a recognition of tenua rangatiratanga, autonomy or self-determination, a cultural renaissance, returning of lands and resources, and reconstituting of affirmative legislation. There are significant and life-affirming implications for decolonizing ourselves and our theologies as tangata whenua. Many Māori theologians have looked to the prophetic voices of the past, like Reverend Jua Wairākena, who often suggested that we needed the freedoms to meet Christ as Māori and not to have our view filtered through a Pākehā lens. Rākena was in fact suggesting a decolonizing of Western Christological models, which he considered paternalistic and created Māori dependence. As tangata whenua, we are to decolonize ourselves and our theologies. This could potentially require an approach embedded in our tikanga, our own customary values and practices, and expressed through our own oral traditions. Essentially, if we are to meet Christ as Māori, true, authentic and decolonized, we need to see and experience Christ through te ao Māori and using our own mātauranga Māori. Decolonization is in many ways a stripping back of the colonial facade that has been imposed on tangata whenua, or in some instances, that has been in intentionally taken on by Māori for survival. Decolonization as a concept and as a construct may yet be reframed, fit for our purposes. As Moana Jackson describes it, decolonization may not be the most appropriate word. Perhaps it could be replaced with the ethic of restoration. The restoration of our people, our faith and our theologies. We as tangata whenua look to tikanga, traditions, values, beliefs, customs, to guide our response. Thank you very much, Te Aroa. Um, 
articulating a poetics of defiance, we have had a poetics of returning, remembering, a poetics towards the eighth day of creation, towards transformative justice, a poetics of lament. We shall now turn to um, an artist, an activist, Maxime de Palme, who will do her art presentation and conversation at this point. Hello, hi. Thank you, India, for inviting me. Um, my piece is called Our Future is Righteousness. Uh, we no longer, we are no longer selling for the template, the immense amounts of social anxiety we carry on how loud our voices or how and when to express joy, overthinking if we are allowed to speak up during a meeting or that we need to smile all day. If not, white people will assume that we are conducting from an angry corner. These are examples. Meeting Western-based expectations of conduct or withstanding white gaze were things that I knew to navigate. None of this was new to me when I moved to the Netherlands as I attended a predominantly white Dutch school, this from preschool to graduation. After the volume of school hours, I would go to my great grandma's house, there a packed living room with cousins and delicious Criolla food for lunch. The togetherness warmed the knowledge of Ubuntu culture to feed my soul. The difference of the two worlds were clear to me early on in life. When moving abroad at the age of 20, I already had knowledge about the Dutch culture, that the Dutch people operate out of an individualistic code of conduct between themselves, not to mention an engagement with the foreigner. Whether I was stand, attending class, walking on the streets, or sitting in the waiting room of a hospital lobby, I always knew that I was being watched and observed. Yet the most impactful realization while living and studying at the art university was the revelation of how deep the white black social conduct goes. I was able to speak proper Dutch and make my point come across using their very own form of wordplay. A lot of my work was and is Afrocentric. This developed from an Afro-Caribbean reaction on Western subjects. Opinions and views on the acknowledgement of black were not appreciated to the point where my colors and subjects didn't fit. The reaction of my classmates not understanding the need for me to approach different subjects than them or argue what to me would be art history didn't sit right to me. I felt like they had decided how it was fitted for me to walk prior to my arrival. Relatable to the written Genesis, my black peers and I were forced to walk in same shameful shoes like Canaan, to pay debts for the mistakes of Ham, so that Noah can alleviate his guilt and conscious of his own acts. That I could navigate the Europeans was not because I approved of their ways, but because I knew <clears throat> what to expect and had learned to permit it from a young age. This piece of knowledge was very disturbing to me. I felt tamed, stained, and trained for centuries of exploitation. As this construct of racial structures, as described in Genesis, the table of nations, where the black race has been appointed for servitude and no seat. As such, Curacao is still being handed, handled on echoes of colonization by the Dutch. The population of the island carry the same passport as the Dutch, therefore the same nationality as the Dutch. The island is an independent nation within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Still, there's no equality for the natives and no part in ruling of the kingdom. The lands and the minds of people have still not been peacefully decolonized. Whether they stay back home on the island and battle the colonial echoes that still roam or to move to the big country of the Netherlands and submit to double consciousness. This play has been wrongfully impacting the lives of the six island natives. It's like a sickness they carry that still has to pass. Sickness that feeds on the language of cowardice disguised as dominance. Toni Morrison, 
suggesting systematically that is expected of the blacks to be teachers of benevolence and prophets of moral conduct to the whites, no matter how, no matter how ugly it gets. A template that can be found in religions, justice system and educational systems. You know, century allows white people to believe all cultures are there for their consumption. So they feed off culture yet sell their whiteness as pure. That Christianity has a has had a big role in pushing this agenda is a fact. Read the Bible. Would you like to excel in the system? Then you're asked to neglect your black consciousness in favor of white ethnocentric standards. A color for eyes have been tainted, have been fully infected by white and are now covered by distortion, pale distortion. Stepping in and out of different codes of conduct, the fall out and add on of hypertensives, hypertensives adapting, mutating, and changing. The abolition of slavery was in 1863. Today is 2021. The African race is worldwide still fighting for equality every single day. We're feeling at our strongest to keep up and simultaneously feeling at our weakest when it comes to living in this constant liminal state of being. Thank you. Thank you very much for this time, for the energy you have generated and for the conversations that we have started here. It's not the end, it's the beginning and it's the continuing journey. And we pray blessings on all of us and good engaging conversations as we continue um, on, on and during EDARE 21. Thank you very much, colleagues.